Portfolio Composer, episode 171. You're listening to the Portfolio Composer podcast with your host and coach, Garrett Hope, where he teaches you what it takes to master the business end of writing music through mindset, marketing, and business skills. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter at theportfoliocomposer.com for exclusive offers, business insights, and information not shared on the podcast. And now for this episode of The Portfolio Composer. I think it takes practice to be turned down repeatedly and still persist. And over all my studies in entrepreneurial skills and, and talks and successes, persistence is the key. And especially if it's persistence where you don't take things personally, you just keep at it. I have countless stories about how that's actually worked out in my favor um, with things that have previously turned me down. So, <laughs> so it's not just it's not just mind over matter or you know facial transcendentalism or some weird self help thing. It's 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 you know this is the real deal. Just keep at it, you know, and don't be don't be offended. Just just do it. So that's uh, something that you have to practice. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Portfolio Composer. I am your host, your coach, and your teacher, Garrett Hope, and I'm very excited that you're spending the time listening to this. And I say that every week, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I am doing this work to help figure out for myself what it means to be a composer, and I want to share this with you. And I think if you are a creative individual and you are taking what you do seriously as a business, because you are a business, and you're trying to figure out what does it mean to market yourself, to have a brand, to put your work out in the world, then you're in the right place. And for that, I am grateful for your attention, and I hope you get a lot out of this. And like I've said many episodes ago, if you have any comments, suggestions, people you think I should interview or topics that should be discussed, send me an email and let me know. And this interview actually comes out of one of those emails from a listener. <laughs> And uh, a few months ago, I got this email from uh, a, a great guy named Adam, and we just started a dialogue, and and lo and behold, Adam has a wealth of resources under his fingertips, and he's here to share them with us. So welcome, Adam. Thank you, Garrett. Adam Shoemaker is a composer, educator, and arts administrator. He currently directs the education programs for the Gilmore Keyboard Festival, where he manages 11 programs that serve thousands of students. Shoemaker also maintains the position of visiting professor of music theory and composition at Kalamazoo College. He freelance composes at night after his family is asleep. (laughs) Like so many of us. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. Tell us about your position at Kalamazoo College and the work you're doing there. Because you're also teaching an entrepreneurship class, right? This, this is correct, yeah. So um, I've been fortunate to, right after graduating with my master's from Western Michigan University, um, they hired me on as an adjunct professor, uh, part-time teaching. And that really it really fueled me. I really enjoyed it uh, as a graduate assistant. Um, and so I kept pursuing different courses and different classes. And I ended up teaching probably most of the theory track throughout my, my eight years of doing that. Um, And during that time, I got involved in Kalamazoo College uh, just teaching applied composition because I needed somebody for one student that has since grown into uh, another seven years past. And uh, now we have a a full composition studio uh, as part of um, a larger music department. Um, And a couple of years ago, they wanted to bring me on more regularly. And so they offered me to teach two classes out of the three quarters that we have. And for the third quarter, uh, they said, well, what would you like to teach? Um, and so I, I had two ideas. One was electronic music, um, which I tested out and decided that the college didn't really need a class like that at the moment. And then I uh, forged ahead and taught arts entrepreneurship that same year um, and started a uh, cross-listed arts entrepreneurship class for musicians and actors and writers and business people. Um, in their junior, senior year of studies at Kalamazoo College. And I've never looked back. And it's been a real passion of mine uh, to incorporate what I learned from my friends. And much like you do, Garrett, you know, interviewing everybody, I have these conversations 
just in my spare time with friends and colleagues and people I meet um, and listening to, you know, podcasts like yours. And I use that to stay informed with best practices and more so um, the arts entrepreneurship class focuses a lot on mindset, Hmm. just like your podcast, which I I resonate with, Um, but not so much the, the hard skills that, you know, of like how to copyright something. And we do address that, but that's sometimes those, uh, those factors change, especially in social media and marketing. So we focus more on developing a creative sensibility towards your profession and your life outside of school um, and how to, how to seek out, you know, work and how to seek out people and how to keep learning and how to keep growing professionally. So um, that's kind of where it's led me. And part of this is tied to my life as an arts administrator too. Um, so that's my, my regular job uh, with the Gilmore Keyboard Festival. And so I've learned a lot about, you know, the nonprofit business and arts presenting and contracts and education and grants and you name it. <laughs> wow. There's so much we can dig in there, but I, I kind of yeah. want to just stay with the arts entrepreneurship class for a while. Sounds and, great. Uh, what kind of questions do the students bring into the class? In particular, what are the needs that you see current junior and seniors who are about to go out into the world? What, what needs do they have as they move forward? Yeah, I wish it was more complex, um, but not to discount the students, but they, the biggest question they have is simply what to do when they graduate. Um, and what to do meaning how to get work, how to get a job, how to make a living, um, all these things that if you were uh, you know, a, on a medical path, you could go get a nursing degree and then, of course, you apply for a nursing job. Or if you know, you're, you're getting a music education degree, you would go apply to be a public school teacher of some kind. Um, so the students I get are very creative students, very passionate students, but they're in fields that aren't so linear with how to approach uh, work after school. So that's the biggest question. And that's the, I'm, I'm constantly surprised on how that is still the question. You know, some, what is it, like 20 years since Angela Beeching wrote her uh, book, Beyond Talent. Mm-hmm. You know, people are still asking that question. Um, I think mostly because it's a very hard question to address and there's not one answer. Right. How do you guide them? It changes every year. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Some things stick around uh, in the class, uh, certain lectures and topics, but we try to hit a bunch of different topics. I spend the whole first week, and this is only a 10-week class, so we're on the the, uh, quarter system. Um, But I try to spend the first week just dissecting the, the mindset of, you know, what they want from their life and their lifestyle at this point in time. So, you know, noticing that if you, if there's a certain thing that you hope you can be able to do or have that the job path that you take will allow you to do so. And this could be material things. This could be uh, time. This could be, you know, travel. This could be the type of work you do. Um, but it's, it's individual for each student. That's what makes it difficult. So there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of free writing, but it's really asking those questions that maybe they've never thought about. Mm-hmm. Like, like how important is, you know, your living situation? Like where would you like to live in a suburb of a nice city with a lawn? Or would you like to live in a more urban area close to everything and you care less about the, you know, the property value? Right. Um, and I try, I try to make it too so that there's not uh, a weight or a standard set in any of this. I try, I try to dissect and dispel and kind of um, take away the, this Id- idyllic American dream of the white picket fence and say you don't <laughs> need that. Uh-huh. It doesn't have to be you. You, you can still have that if you want. I'm not going to discount that either. But there's so many things out there. What, what do you think you really want? Um, that kind of sets the stage for how they might look for career paths and opportunities um, in their chosen interest areas. 
I really like that, Adam, a whole lot because it it helped. Yeah, it, it's it it's encouraging them to kind of form their own dream, and then I, what I hear you saying is what could be a next step is to take action, to go out there and make things happen. Absolutely. Which is yeah, critical. and just to, yeah, once once you kind of have any sort of dream, and it doesn't even have to be too detailed out. And I, as I tell them too, these these ideas can change from month to month, from year to year. But it's an internal dialogue that's important to keep active and alive as you get busy. Um, and so, you know, part of that is once they define even just a little nugget of that work or that lifestyle dream, then they can start to see who's doing what, how they're doing it, and what kind of lifestyle that affords them. Um, or what kind of lifestyle does it create? Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's not necessarily a right way, but there's definitely paths and directions to go with certain choices. Yeah. Well, that's the beautiful thing about this, is that we have so many options, and it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, and that's, that's again, another st- point I try to stress is that there's not just this idea that you get a degree and you get a job with that degree. Like there are so many things to do. And that's another uh, theme of the course is looking and exploring all these things and finding new ones and seeing how they fit together and seeing who's doing what and how they're doing it. And um, again, much like the podcast, I, I, <laughs> I was telling something the other day, I was like, yeah, this guy named Garrett Hope has this podcast and like, I don't know where he finds all these people, but like there was this, there's this one, one guest that all she does is assist composers, like as a, you know, a, a virtual assistant in a way. It's like, that's, that's amazing. It is amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And it's, and, and nobody, nobody knows where those jobs are or how to find them or create them or, you know, all those, all those things that, uh, again, a, a more linear career path might tell you. Right, and so it's our job to kind of learn as we go, and uh, and find find those paths and be be inquisitive and curious about it. Well, if you know, as a twenty one year old or twenty two year old, if someone had told me that I can just create my job, I w- I wouldn't have believed them. And I would have said, well, <laughs> yeah. what does that mean? How do you do that? And I think that's exactly where those those students are. And a lot of it is just trying things out, doing it, doing something. Doing something exactly, not just waiting to be that something, but actually just be it. You know, if you're going to be a writer, why aren't you writing and trying to publish right now while you're in school? That's that's my another big point is just become active. You know, mm-hmm. um, seek things out right now while while you're getting your degree. That way, you have practiced those skills. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, and you know what I'm talking about, but it's a it's a hard thing to quantify into a, a more linear course. <laughs> yeah. Well, and maybe this uh, applies to how you can teach this, but you know, in the podcast, I end up speaking with a lot of people who have built a career because they did something. And, and that has led to success, which then snowballs and grows. Um, and there becomes a kind of a survivor bias a little bit in music that, oh, well, they did it and I couldn't or, or, you know, this kind of, um, oh, yeah. I'm not describing it well, but we look at some people who have out been out there and done that and, and it's like, okay, well they did it because of these exceptional situations. But I think most of the time it's just that they did something. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that, that is true. I, I feel like <laughs> there's a lot of times where people go, oh, you just need like to make a big once and then you're set. I'm like, well, even even the people that we see in the media that have all of a sudden made it big, there wasn't an all of a sudden, actually. It was a lot of hard, persistent work, mm-hmm. you know, over many, many years. And it might look different for different famous people or successful people, um, but it's there. And you just have to look a little deeper and see, well, what were they doing that got them there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in talking a little bit more about your work at doing the nonprofit stuff and for the the keyboard festival. Yeah, tell me tell me what you do and and what about the festival and everything that rolls into that. Yeah, so the the Gilmore Keyboard Festival is a biennial festival in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and every two years we have 
a gigantic keyboard music festival all throughout the city. Um, last last year, there was probably about 70 to 90 events, depending on what you were counting, uh, within a two-week window. Um, and we have amazing artists come through, uh, classical, jazz, pop, and outliers, you know, uh, all centered around the love of keyboard music. And so I've been fortunate to work for the festival as the director of education. Um, and with that, it's really an administrative role that uh, manages, uh, helps with the fundraising, uh, manages the budget, manages the staff, and the division behind uh, about 11 different education programs. Um, and the bulk of these programs is our Piano Lab program, which teaches group piano lessons to students, mostly within the public school system um, in Kalamazoo and Battle Creek, Michigan. But we also have some alternative labs where we're, that are staffed with music therapists. Um, and so they're teaching different curriculums for students with disabilities or you know, students with uh, uh, emotional um, things they're working through. And so it's a, it's a really, I mean, I could go on all day about what I do, but there's a, there's a lot of different um, programming and facets that I'm involved in. I'm kind of in charge of overseeing that. Okay. Um, and in addition, as, as any nonprofit employee will also, um, I think, attest to is that other duties as assigned is a big is a big uh, job description <laughs> item. And one of those duties I made myself was live streaming, if that's an okay segue for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I did. So, I, I, yeah. Yes, let's dive right into it. T- tell me about and that. So, you, you're live streaming every concert or just select concerts? Uh, it's increasing. So okay. uh, long story short, you know, in 2012, we live streamed a free event for the community that was um, performed by Kirill Gerstein, uh, one of our past Gilmore artists. And that's an award that we give um, every four years. And um, this concert, you know, because it was free, because it was open, um, they were like, well, what if we live streamed it? And so they, I was like, I will do that. I will make that happen. They tasked me with it. Um, we collaborated with a local uh, media company, Public Media Network, and live streamed the sold out concert. And it was a, it was a really good success. And we learned a lot of the technical side of things. Um, and I learned how to kind of manage the live streaming um, technology and coordination. And ever since there, I kind of had to fight through to get um, our community and our, you know, our staff and board to buy into the live streaming uh, ideals. Um, the biggest concern, of course, is being offering something for free where everybody else is buying a ticket to be there. Ah. Um, and so I've been a strong advocate for that being a non-issue from the beginning before anybody really knew um, with any sort of statistics. And since then, we've we've slowly, a little too slowly for me personally, but I still love where, where I work, so I can't, I can't complain too much, to the point where we just, um, our first four concerts of this year, uh, we are streaming live, and we just finished um, the third of the fourth, and we have one more in December, and then for the first time ever, we're planning on streaming uh, a variety of concerts from our Gilmore Keyboard Festival in April and May. Okay. And so, and so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting procedure and there's a lot of, a lot of work to be done, but that's kind of my, <laughs> I, I don't want to call it a hobby because it's actually my job, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, a passion. It's, been, it's been a passion that I've added on to my workload uh, because I believe in it wholeheartedly. Well, I, I have so many questions because I yeah. tried live streaming a concert that we were putting on last year and I basically logged into the Wi-Fi, set my iPad up on a, a stand and then hit, you know, I just did it through Facebook Live. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, audio was terrible and I couldn't see the screen, so it wasn't positioned just right. And, <laughs> and then there are data transfer issues and streaming speed. Uh, I mean, g- walk us through what are like the top technical considerations that a composer who wants to live stream an event needs to think about. All of those technical issues are like the bane of my existence sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so part of what I've been working on is kind of tracking and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Cataloging different ways to live stream. So, 
my first live stream experience, experience, I had a video crew with like four HD remote cameras controlled by two people. Um, I had an audio engineer and I, I bought a subscription to livestream.com, which wasn't the cheapest. Um, and, you know, we had all of this technical support. Um, but the first thing we had to deal with, and this is, this is where I'll go first, was the bandwidth and the internet access. And so we were at an auditorium that was managed by the school district. It's a beautiful auditorium, Chenery Auditorium in Kalamazoo. And we had, we spent probably three, almost three full days back and forth with my video team and, you know, troubleshooting with our subscription to live stream and the equipment we were using. And we had to get the tech people to get, a, get the computer that was managing the cameras, the right login for the internet access. And we had to hardwire it and run a cable and do all these things. So that I guess the moral of the story is that you have to check your internet connection. And sometimes this is um, you know, more technical and actually going to an IT person and checking the bandwidth. And looking up the the latest you know bandwidth uh, ideals for live streaming, if you're just streaming from a device, sometimes it's simply just doing a test stream. So I, I've streamed from my phone a lot for our piano camp that we run. Can I want to stop you kind of real off-site. quick? Adam. Yeah, go ahead. For, it's, there are some people who are listening who, when you say bandwidth, it's like Charlie Brown's teacher. Can you? <laughs> Can, you, can we dig into the tech speak a little bit here and, and help people understand what bandwidth means? Sure. I will preface this with um, I am not a technician. Um, my my technical prowess comes in the form of audio, and even then, I'm not the best of the best. I just took about three classes and have done a lot of my own audio work. Sure. Um, so so I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding of bandwidth is essentially how much information can pass through the internet, or basically an upload speed. Um, at a time or per second, you know, so you're looking at like megabytes per second or gigabytes, you know, if you had ever had that, you know, a fortunate experience, but it's basically an upload speed and how much uh, could go on at the same time. Is that, is that your understanding, Garrett? That's mine too. And I think uh, yeah. one way we experience this regularly, whether we're aware of it or not, is when we go to YouTube and we play a video, YouTube tests the bandwidth of the connection we're on and it'll automatically stream at what it feels is the appropriate rate. So you exactly. could you could click on an HD video but then be watching it in 420. And you're like, why is yeah. it grainy? I, and it's because YouTube thinks your bandwidth isn't fast enough to handle all the data that needs to go through. Yeah, to get to get that flawless video experience. So you need all that data to get the quality. Basically the higher the quality video and audio, the more bandwidth you need. And Typically, we have more download power than we do have upload power. Mm-hmm. Um, but you need that upload power to stream live because you're basically uploading to the internet and then your users on the other end access that through their own download bandwidth. So yeah, um, the, and if you're de- I'm going to approach it from you know, dealing with a phone. If you're streaming from a phone, um, Facebook Live will do this for you. Like they'll basically say we can't, <laughs> we can't continue to be on Facebook Live because uh, your internet connection is not strong enough. Mm-hmm. And this is this happens happened to me frequently. And so um, before you do anything, before you try to uh, organize a live stream, testing that um, even with your own devices, the way that you're going to do it is the most important thing to make sure it's possible. Um, when I deal with different buildings or institutions, I contact the IT person. I just ask them um, and get a, get a feeling for that. It, I know when you're working, or at least it's been my experience, working with educational institutions that they lock down their computers. And that's a, primarily for the student's safety. But that also means that you have a really difficult time getting the, uh, the permissions to access certain websites or data ports. So Correct. how do you go about asking for the assistance in, in the way that they're going to help you? Because some IT people are just rolling their eyes and not helpful. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you need your device that you're going to stream with, whether that's a phone or, um, or a computer. 
whatever the signal is going through to the internet, you need to have that available and you need to get with an IT person. Um, you know, it's not always easy. I, there, there's not like a, not always a direct path. I know at Kalamazoo College, we have a fairly small IT team. Um, and I just contact their main line and I say, who can help me with this? Um, and even though I'm a, you know, I'm a regularly, I like to call myself a regularly visiting professor here, um, I have access to the internet and I've, I've gone through the, the little um, download tests they do for my device and I have to do that every single year. But when I bring in an outside film crew with a computer that's running the cameras, I have to have that tested. And if it's not working right, I have to get a secure login made for that. And so it does take a lot of lead time sometimes. Mm, okay. But if, you're, but if you're just on the phone, I mean, a lot of times you can just say, okay, I really want to do a live stream for this concert with this phone. Um, can you, and then you try to get the same access that a student or a professor would have to the servers, which is usually en- enough to, to get by unless the, the school is really behind the times. Right. Well, they should have a, a T1 minimum, I would think. Yeah, but you know that's that's something you have to test and check. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So beyond bandwidth and internet access, what else do we need to think about? Um, so once your connectivity is good, you know the the audio has been the big thing that's been perplexing me. So like, I mean, ideally, if you can collaborate with a video team and have somebody running multiple camera angles and taking care of that look of you know cutting between shots, that's my favorite. Um, but most of us don't have that access. Um, and I could talk more about that later, about how to maybe find collaborators. But let's say we're going from a device, like a phone or an iPad. Um, the audio, as anybody's heard, the mic on the audio is really mostly EQ'd for your voice um, or people's voices in general. And so the room sound that you might get from an iPhone or an iPad just doesn't end up sounding very good. And I, I think there's a certain point it's somewhat forgiving um, if you're just kind of doing your own thing that people get over it. But from my end, if you can get the best possible audio experience, um, people will be more likely to watch your stream and stay on it. And you'll be more likely to use that video later as a resource for your YouTube channel or grant submissions or just having a portfolio of your work. Mm. Um, with good audio. And so um, if you're just running from a device, and this is, this is what I'm talking on right now, actually, is my new microphone. Um, I've been doing a lot of research. I've been calling guys at Sweetwaters, uh, asking them about things, what they know, um, trying to find a really good mic for, a, for an audio, for like a phone or an iPad. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of options out there, but they're not always obvious. Um, so there's a lot of testing to do um, with those devices and figure out well, what kind of basic stereo sound can I go for. And that's the thing I think that uh, people need to watch out for. There's a lot of audio interfaces for iPhone. There's also a lot of microphones for iPhone that aren't stereo, meaning they have a left and right channel. And so we really need that stereo field to get a, a really good, clean sound of our music because even if we're placing... Um, the microphone and the phone kind of centered around, let's say, a string quartet. You're still going to have a little interplay of when the first violin plays and the cellist plays or the, the violist plays because of that slight spatial difference. And that can make just uh, the world of difference in a listening experience. I'm constantly amazed by the stereo field. Yeah, uh, It's a simple concept, but it's when done right and with the right microphone, it just sounds natural and good. So what yeah. is the microphone you're using now? We, I want to put it in the show notes. Sure, yeah. So I, I, I actually just picked this up Tuesday. It's, um, it's a Shure uh, S, what is it, MV88. Uh, so I think it's called a Mot- Motive 88. Okay. And it's a little stereo mic that plugs into the lightning port of your phone. And it's um, self-powered through the phone. So I think it's running like a little uh, a little stereo mic with a um, you know condenser, so forty eight volt uh, phantom power through the phone. And this mic has a it's got a little thing to pivot, so you can plug it in either way, but it pivots ninety degrees, so you can kind of direct it towards the sound. And it comes with an app that allows you to change the configuration of the microphone, so you can do a full stereo sound with varying degrees. 
from like, you know, I, th- I think it's actually about 120. I have to check the specs, but, you know, wide, wide angle to a really focused angle. Um, you can also do cardioid patterns and other mic patterns that might be more for mono mixes. Um, but when using that app, it basically overrides the audio input of your phone. So if you're on Facebook Live, if you're on Skype like I am on my phone right now, it's going to take the audio input from the microphone once that app's up and running and recognizes that it's got the mic plugged in. And so that's kind of what I'm looking for for the, for the iOS devices or, or mobile devices is something that triggers the audio to be pulled from that device and not the phone. Because mm-hmm. um, if you don't, it's just going to pull from the, the phone microphones. And is that an expensive mic? Do you know what the street price is on that? <laughs> yeah, this one I got on sale for one hundred and twenty dollars. So it's um, it's pricier than I was looking at, but it's not. I don't treat it, think of it as super super expensive. Um, and there's also I found out there's also interfaces um, out there that you can plug a mobile device into that will also override the audio. And so you, I mean, I've been on the search for um, the optimal you know, dual channel interface. So you could actually plug whatever mics you have into it, but I'll let you know. I'll let you know if I find the optimal one. (laughs) Sure. Well, I think that's a pretty minimal investment for someone who wants to make live streaming a regular part of what they're doing. Yeah. And so I have this on um, my setup is basically this microphone on my phone and it's attached to a, a iPhone clip that attaches to a mic stand. And so I can place it um, wherever the shot's going to be good and the sound's going to be good. I kind of treat it as like if you're standing right there in your space and it sounds good in your ears with a good stereo microphone, it should sound very similar to what you hear. So you don't want to be, and this is, this is another stressor of mine, because I see a lot of live videos that are really far back from the audience. I mean, with a phone, should probably be closer than not. So capturing your performer's um, probably just your performers in a really tight shot so that the mic and the video is close. Have you found that's disruptive for the people who are there to see it live? Well, uh, oh, to see the equipment up there? Yeah. You know, this is this has been brought up before um, in staff meetings at the Gilmore, but I think we're kind of used to seeing microphones being placed um, in front of a piano or in front of an orchestra or up high. Like when a, when a real high quality audio engineer is doing some really good recording for posterity or for other purposes, I think the audience is somewhat used to seeing things um, in the line of sight, but not uh, in a way that's super distracting. And so if you're talking about an iPhone on a mic stand, it's just like having a mic there. You're not really you're not really taking up too much of the visual space, and I feel generally speaking, people are usually forgiving of it. Got it. Okay, so we've covered bandwidth and internet access and audio. Any other technical considerations? Well, there's there's so many, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, test, test, test. Like you, just like any equipment you use, you cannot be certain it's working properly until you get it to do exactly what you want it to do before you have to do it. Um, and so once you get your mic, you know, just, just like when I bought this microphone, I was testing it on an event actually, so it's probably not the best practice. But I wasn't, I wasn't you know, hoping to get this most pristine video. I just brought it to an event to test it. And I noticed that um, when Sure tells me to turn off the, or turn on the do not disturb button, it really means it because it picks up, the, picks up the cell phone signals coming in. And I was getting a lot of text at the time and I heard it distort the audio. Um, So by doing tests on your live stream before you stream, um, you can kind of work out those bugs and uh, figure out what's going to be the best possible sound. Um, But other than like, you know, upload bandwidth and um, testing and getting a good sound, I think, you know, that's that's really the most important thing. Um, I think the phones out there now, they all have video that is high enough quality to get a good shot um, to where the video is never going to be distracting. And that's, that's the biggest thing I try to focus on is making sure that the live stream experience is not distracting for someone to watch. Or they go, man, that sounds really weird. Or man, that looks really weird. You want someone to go, oh, I'm just looking at this and it sounds like I would expect it to look. Or right. it sounds like it, what I would expect it to sound like. Now you've brought up the iPhone quite a bit. And this is uh, mics that are specifically designed to plug into an iPhone. I'm assuming that there's 
equipment also for Android phones and other non Apple devices? Yes. Um, I haven't necessarily looked for it myself because I'm just kind of focusing on what I have. Sure. Um, but there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, USB driven devices out there that can connect to mini USB and whatnot that I kind of have come across. And that might be some more of the interfaces that you find. Um, but I do find a, a surprisingly a surprising low number of stereo mics out there that plug directly into the phone. So it's, it's definitely worth investigating more, especially as this equipment becomes more affordable. Got it. Now, I want to go back to a comment you made a long time ago. You, you said that there has been a debate amongst the leadership of the Gilmore Keyboard Festival about doing something for free when you're charging for tickets. How did you make the argument and how are you advocating for continued live streaming uh, dis- for value? Yeah, so I think, it's, um, I think it is a fair question to ask. And the question is, will we lose ticket sales or attendance figures if I choose to live stream my event for free to the public online? Um, and so that's, that's assuming somebody is going to cho- choose to watch your live stream event at home instead of coming to your concert. And the argument I have always made um, before I really knew anything was that the people who want to come to the concert are going to come whether or not it's available online. The reason being, I think that people you've already connected with and encouraged to buy tickets realize the value of live concert hall and the value of a live music experience Whereas they, you know, viewing something on a phone or a computer or even a computer connected TV is never the same. Um, there's definitely just a disconnect there. And any concert goer can, can realize that uh, as long as you assume they're intelligent. You know? <laughs> um, and so it's, it's a trust you have with your audience members. Where the benefits come is that if for some reason somebody can't make the concert, they are now connected as part of your community. They're, they have the ability to, to participate without having to be there, and they can still be involved, and you know they're going to catch the next one because they're in town again. The other benefits that you get is that people who don't know you or have no idea what the concert experience that you provide is like, they will look at it and go, so this is what, a, or for my example, this is what a Gilmore concert looks like. That looks really sweet. Oh my gosh, those performers are incredible. I wish I was there. Mm-hmm. And they're watching the live stream, and I'm sure somebody's thinking, man, I wish I was there. I hope I catch it next time. Right. And there have been some studies, mostly in the pop music world, attributing artists who live stream more often concert footage, actual concert footage, or live music engagement online. They connect that to higher ticket sales and also higher fan base or, or not only higher fan base, but a more dedicated fan base. And so it's, um, it's kind of goes beyond what it actually is. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a basically a TV show of your concert at the time of your concert, but it's ability, it's an, it's, it gives you the ability to connect to a greater community and also serve that community that might be outside of your local, local place. Right. Well, and I think everyone's going to recognize that there's nothing that can replace a live performance either. There's not. Yeah. Did you listen to the interview with John David Mann when we were talking about his recent book, the recipe? Uh, No, I didn't No. Well, one of the things he did uh, kind of as pre promotion for the book is he gave away many, many copies. And what he's found out is by giving out this content, by giving out basically the book itself, he has now been able to sell more copies than he would have otherwise. And he's self-publishing this book. And I think in music, there's ways we can do that too. And this strikes me as one of those ways. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's kind of letting people experience it um, at a free level and you're not degrading anything. You're pr- trying to provide the best video and audio quality you can. But then you're also kind of, saying if if you want the real thing you need to show up. Yeah, and I think you know that's that's kind of what what I'm what I'm assuming is a kind of the spirit of people who are for creative commons and kind of open source stuff is that yes. yeah. They 
the spirit of sharing is a powerful, powerful thing that is often um, or tries to be undercut by, well, our, our, why aren't we making a profit? You know, um, but that never should be an issue. You know, they, of course, set up the set up the systems that will allow you to make an income, but invite people in. Don't just wait. Don't don't create a barrier for them to get in, especially if they don't know what it is. Um, and so I think, yeah, like you said, live streaming is just one of those uh, ways we can connect to a greater community and also market ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. You had said that you would give us a little bit of insight on how we can find collaborators to do the video. I'm really curious what you have to say about that. Yeah, so um, when I started uh, doing live streaming with the Gilmore, I basically, I, I'm fortunate to work in a building that has a lot of arts organizations in the same building. And so I took the elevator up to the third floor and I went to um, some people called Public Media Network. And they are basically our community cable access channel. Um, anybody in the community can rent equipment, get trained on it, and make a TV show that's on you know, the local cable channels. Um, they also have some live streaming. They do you know, public um, streaming of you know, government uh, meetings and other things that are probably a little less thrilling, you know, mm. but important for people who want to keep up to date with that. And they're really a, a strong community partner. And so their mission is to provide access, media access for the community. Um, so I went up to them and said, hey, I want to stream a concert. And the only thing they really needed was the ability to use that footage for their cable access. Um, and so we partnered together with the Gilmore uh, and the public media. And we used their camera equipment and put together um, what we thought would be the best shots. And they provide the video content, and I kind of directed the, you know, the graphics and that we created at the Gilmore and brought to public media, and they just kind of inserted it and hosted the video for us. So they basically ran the video. Um, and that's what they do. They, they run video shoots. They, they have six you know, um, cameras that are remote-controlled via um, uh, central control like through a TriCaster, and doing things with other arts organizations where they can present um, performances is great for their channels. It's um, great for their, uh, their, what's the word I'm looking for? Their reputation as a community, as a community partner. Um, and it's a great, uh, great collaboration for us. And so I find that a lot of communities have, um, have groups like this. Sometimes it might not be as common in smaller, uh, smaller cities, but the, the spirit behind it is that, you know, who do you know that's doing video and how can you mutually benefit from it? Yeah. And so there's, there's not always the fortunate um, existence of a not, another nonprofit that does video work. But that's the, that's the first place I'd say go look. You know, is there somebody in the nonprofit sector that's using video um, a lot? And then beyond that, you know, I think as like a freelancer, so I've, I've live streamed uh, my own concerts and about once a year, I fund and produce a concert of new music that's mostly my music or all of my music. And I've made live streaming a priority. Um, and if we can't find, if you can't find another nonprofit that focuses on media or video access, you know, thinking about what kind of in-kind arrangement I could find with uh, a freelance video person or um, another video company, um, what kind of exchanges could you do? if you have those relationships in your network. Um, Cause I find that, you know, there's so much that can happen in live streaming with the video and the audio and the images that if, you, if you're running the whole concert, it's probably the last thing you want to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and so having, having a small team of people to help you with that is really important to make sure it's a seamless experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you can find people who are, you know, passionate video um video creators, then there's always a way to find, find a, a way to connect to a live streaming um, option there. And I think I've been fortunate to have such good uh, community partners in Kalamazoo to do this stuff. But, you know, I have done a little bit of research in kind of uh, open source um, video management programs for computers that you can basically, you know, plug cameras in that you have and manage a small you know, a few shots through having, uh, I think it's called, 
Oh, I can't remember the acronym. It's basically an open video um, program. Oh, OBS. Is okay. That what it is? I'm looking at my computer here. Um, but again, I haven't I haven't been forced to use that yet. Um, but if you if you have any sort of tech capabilities, or you have friends that do, finding people that are motivated by that and seeing if you can you know work together to make make a live stream happen happen. Um, but again, that multi camera shoots a hard thing to do. Um, even with a video team, it takes it takes a lot of finesse and equipment and uh, know how to connect that equipment to the right platforms. Right. Well, in, in the simplest thing, I mean, we've kind of gone really technical into all this. You really just need an internet or 4G connection <laughs> and a phone, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. If you even yeah, even if you don't have Wi-Fi or internet connection, you can do it over um, you know over the uh, the LTE or four G connections. And again, it's a thing you have to test. Um, some places work, some places don't. Um, it does eat a lot of data, so make sure your data plan's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, passing video and audio at the same time—that's a lot of data. Yeah. Yeah, but if you can get that audio sounding good, most people don't really need a multi-camera. Shoot. Of course, it looks great, and if you are an organization um, that has any sort of reputation, you probably want to do the highest level you can afford to do. Um, but if you're just a freelancer, yeah, get your phone out, plug in a mic, get in a mic stand, and do it. You know. Mm, yeah. Well, this has been awesome, Adam. Do you have any kind of final words of encouragement or words of advice? Uh, things I didn't ask you that you think we need to know. Gosh. Hmm. I can't think of anything. I feel like you've tapped a lot of my my information. Again, there's just a lot. <laughs> I had a, a lot, lot of questions. Of technical, yeah, there's there's a lot of technical things to sift through. Um, so you kind of have to I kind of have to document what you learn and how how things work. Um, if you're unfamiliar with uh, even just like streaming to YouTube, you know that took me probably about a full day with my video team. Um, Friends, my really just friends of mine at this point, but they're you know with their video equipment to figure out how do we connect this crazy computer to this YouTube stream, <laughs> right? Um, and I still don't know. I still don't know what exactly we did right, but I did write it down. So, <laughs> so when I go back to that, I can find okay, insert stream key here, you know, and do this, and I have a little link to tut- tutorial. So. Um, you don't have to be a you know a wizard at this. You just have to take good notes and spend some time googling to to find the best way to do it. But again, if you just want to set up your phone, you know, um, I, and, I'll, and I'll stress too that you know capturing a video uh, live stream can also translate into a video for the record of your piece and use for grant applications for portfolio. And people say, hey, man, what do you write like? And you say, oh, well, check out this video of my latest performance. It's already there because you live streamed it. Mm-hmm. And you can download that video onto your phone and then just upload it to wherever you want. And the audio is connected and it's good to go. And you don't need the most pristine equipment to edit it. You just throw it into a simple video editor if you need to um, and go for it. And so it's really nice because you, you not only are connecting to your community and networking your um you know, your performances through you know, social media live streams, but you're also preserving your work and keeping record of it um, for use later. Right. And I think what's really important is just just do it. If you're putting on concerts and you should be, just just stream it. Yeah, and if for some reason the the live stream stops working, you know, just record a video and then post it later. I, this has happened to me too. Like, just the, I tested it. I get up there. That my signal changes. And I don't have time to deal with it. Um, if we advertise it, put a little note that you know I'll have to post the video later, and then record that video and get that video done. You know, <laughs> right? Well, Adam, thank you so much. Why don't we take a quick break and we'll come back for the lightning round? Thanks, Garrett. I am in the process of booking speaking gigs and seminars and workshops for the spring. If you are an educator and would like me to Skype in or visit your classroom or school to talk about the business of music, setting yourself up for success after graduation, what it means to think like a small business owner, branding, marketing, or mindset, 
send me an email. You can do that most easily through the PortfolioComposer.com website. There's a contact page which allows you to fill out a form and send me a quick email. I'd love to discuss this with you further before all my time gets completely eaten up. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you guys. Thanks. Welcome to the lightning round. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? A very good question. I probably wouldn't have listened to it. Um, (laughs) But (laughs) the biggest thing is to get out there and do things. Um, And I say that broadly for my other artists that might tune in um, or people who are not composers. But you know, if you're a composer, just get out and make concerts happen, perform, um, arrange performances, just do something and keep at it. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I know I know for myself, um, I spent I spent countless years not doing anything unless it was a found opportunity or a submission or I applied for it um, where I should have been doing my own thing while trying to you know, do the applications and submissions, but make my own concerts, make my own recordings. Um, because, and especially now it's so easy to do. There's so many ways to do it. Um, the technology is great and it's affordable and you should, if you're not doing it right now, whether you're a high schooler or a college student or you're just out of college, you should be doing things. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. What is a personal habit of yours that you feel leads to your success? I'm, I don't have a lot of habits other than not having routines. (laughs) Okay. So, um, I I hear hear a lot of uh, really interesting guests on your show and like, I read a lot of other books about entrepreneurialism and strategies and a lot of real organized people. And I admire that. Um, but I think my, I just call it a habit. So I can't really refer to qualities, but my habit that I'm that I've been forming and strengthening is the habit of being persistent and not necessarily um, shaken by a lack of things working out. Um, and this is kind of a quality and a habit, but it takes I think it takes practice to be turned down repeatedly and still persist. Um, and over all my studies in entrepreneurial uh, skills and, and talks and successes, persistence is the key. And especially if it's persistence where you don't take things personally, you just keep at it. Um, I have countless stories about how that's actually worked out in my favor um, with things that have previously turned me down. So, <laughs> so it's, not just, it's not just mind over matter or you know, facile transcendentalism or some weird <laughs> self-help thing. It's... it's, it's you know, this is the real deal. Just keep at it, you know, and don't be, don't be offended. Just, just do it. So that's uh, something that you have to practice. It really is. It really is. I'm assuming you're a keyboard player. <laughs> no, I'm not. Really? <laughs> Even though you, you run a keyboard lab and you work for the, the keyboard festival? Yep. So um, I, take, I take pride that I'm not a pianist uh, by trade because... Even though I run a piano-heavy program, um, it kind of allows me to step aside and keep any piano opinions out of it. Um, so I've, I've learned a lot about the keyboard from working with the Keyboard Festival and a lot about piano pedagogy, and it's been really rewarding, but I'm really an arts administrator. <laughs> Interesting. So what is your instrument? Uh, trumpet was my first instrument, and then I picked up trombone. Uh, and guitar around the same time in high school. Oh, excellent. So what's an instrument you've always wanted to learn to play? Well, naturally, I've always wanted to be better at piano. Sure. Um, but in terms of like just an instrument I think would be really cool to play, bass clarinet I think is just, I don't know, something <laughs> about those low reeds. Um, I think it's a really cool sound. I've dabbled a little bit when I was teaching middle school band, and I just love the sound and the feel of it. Um, but piano and bass clarinet would be my two answers. <laughs> oh, excellent. I don't think anyone has yet said bass clarinet. So you've got, no, you're really? the first there. Yep. Well, it's like, it's kind of like a, I don't know. It's kind of like a low saxophone, but 
I don't know, smoother, more, more clear. I mean, the clarinet's such a, yeah, it's such a cool instrument. Yeah. yeah warmer. Yeah. I can still really rip on it though. You know? Oh yeah. I, <laughs> it's a pretty cool instrument actually. Um, you're familiar with this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What is one composition that had a profound impact on you and why? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. And I, I remember reading this and hearing it over and over again, and I constantly go, man, what would, <laughs> what would that be? Um, and, you know, it's, I can't say it's one per se, um, but I kind of didn't know a lot about classical music until I went to college. And I'd have to say that the whole minimalism and post-minimalism track, especially starting with Philip Glass, of course, really had a big influence on my, my early days of making music um, in a way that just kind of opened my... It kind of connected, I guess. It connected my perceptions of what was kind of, a, you know, a band kid mixed with... You know, I was in, I was in rock ska bands and singer-songwriter stuff. And it really blended that all together for me and really connected to me to a whole new world of contemporary music. Um, that was probably my, my biggest change or life changing experience for my ears. Is there a particular but, Philip Glass no. piece that really sticks out to you? I wish I could like remember back to my, like, you know, college or, you know, those origins, but not, not necessarily. Um, of course I love his, uh, just his piano solo CD, you know, that kind of iconic uh, oh, the, is Philip it Glass CD. Like Metamorphosis? Oh. and Oh, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, and just those those always, like, just those kind of hit my nostalgia for me. Um, but, you know, yeah, just th- there's so many to choose from. Um, but in terms of an actual piece, like, really uh, – ringing true to my ears. I'm actually going to go to a bar talk and concerto for orchestra. Ooh, great. I, I normally am not an orchestra fan, um, but I just love something about that, that language he uses. I just love, I just absolutely love. It's a brilliant work. It really is. It's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Can you name a piece by a minority or female composer that you feel we should all listen to and know? Again, I had an answer for this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, it's been something that I have been working on as a teacher to incorporate more of that into my curriculum, thanks to all the lovely resources out there. Um, but I, I keep it close to home, and my, I have a friend, a colleague, uh, Cassandra Kazor, who I really admire as a composer, and she's up and coming. Um, and I, I love the work that she does. Um, and so if I could, you know, I'm not sure if you could find all this piece out there. Um, but last year I helped present a song cycle of hers called Dried Tobacco. And it was, um, it's a song cycle from uh, a, a homosexual poet from the South who uh, just wrote about his experiences coming out um, in a rural Southern town that wasn't so hip on that, if I can just be blunt. Um, and she she really set the score in a way that just uh, kind of shakes you, you know. So um, she's very very much a social activist with her music. I really admire that. So everybody should check out Cassandra Kazor. Is that well? How do you spell her last name? Yeah, her Cassandra like it like it normally is, and then Kazor is uh, K A C Z O R. K A C Z O R. Excellent. Yeah, definitely yeah. find what I can and link to it. So, yeah, so I mean, there's a lot, and there's so many great composers I keep finding, so it's just, it's hard. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, people hate that question, but I, I like it because I'm always learning about new things. So as one who teaches arts entrepreneurship, I met you're encountering and reading a, a large stream of books that are valuable, but could you list one to three books that you think every composer should have on their shelf and read? Yeah, um... <laughs> I, I, wish, I wish I was reading more these days with my, my two young kids at home. I, reading's kind of taken a back seat. But I do, so the one thing I do read is kind of the entrepreneurial mindset books. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and when I can. And one of the interesting ones, I can't say I found like the the quintessential book for everybody, um, but I try to keep a rotating shelf of books that hit on different areas. And one of those is um, Chris Brogan's book called Freak Shouldn't, uh, Freaks Shall Inherit the Earth. And it's a really intriguing read. Um, and it's not even arts driven, but it's an entrepreneurial mindset book, business book. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a curious read for um, people who need a little more uh, conversational business savvy. Okay. And then, and then of course, um, I keep using this book because it keeps being very effective for my students in all disciplines, not just music, but Angela Beeching's uh, Beyond Talent is a really, really effective book. Um, and then something I'm working through right now, um, I had the opportunity, thanks to a regional grant um, that was uh, given to me through DePaul University in Greencastle, Illinois. And they launched their 21 Century Musician Program uh, organization. And they also wrote a book to kind of teach this, uh, this new way of thinking about being a musician. Um, and what, anyway, it's funny, I can't remember the title off the top of my head. Um, but it's 21CM's uh, book, Entre- what is it, Entrepreneurial Something. I probably, let, me, let, me, let me look it up real quick. It's just on my shortcuts here. Sure. But it's, uh, it's, it's an online textbook. Um, and so I'm, I'm considering it for my class in the spring because it's so interesting. I really love so far the language they're using. Oh, it's just called Introduction to Music Entrepreneurship. Um, but the language they're using is very well thought out very timely and very precise, but, but at the same time, it, uh, it reaches a lot of the theoretical um, that we talk about and just entrepreneurial mindset and also links it to, to actual. So it's, a, it's been, so far, it's a good read. Well, that's awesome. Fantastic. Well, this has been, oh, I almost forgot. To, oh. <laughs> how can people find you on the internet and how can they get a hold of you? <laughs> Well, uh, I need to update my website, and I've, I've listened to a few of your podcasts about how important that can be. But, um, but I do have a website. It's just adamshoemaker.com. My last name is S-C-H-U-M-A-K-E-R. Um, and that's just one way to find me. Uh, I'm also on uh, Facebook. Um, I have a Facebook page, um, at The Shoemaker. And uh, you can find me through the Gilmore Keyboard Festival's education page, too, if you want. Awesome. Well, do you have any last words before we sign off? Well, um, I hope to be uh, doing more of these, you know, discussions, uh, entrepreneurial discussions and linking specifically to live streaming tactics. I think, you know, it's a, it's been going on for a while now, but people should just get out there and try some live streaming. You know, Um, if you're, if the hesitation is, putting your music out there before people are buying it or people are paying for a ticket or people are commissioning you. I just don't think it should be. I think you should just ignore that, that feeling and just go for it. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. Well, maybe I should have you on and you can come and be a a guest teacher in one of the group coaching calls I do for the Patreon sponsors. Sure. And we can, I'd love to, we can actually do a workshop on live streaming, which would be tremendous. That'd be great. Yeah. Cool. It it helped me refine my thoughts too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Adam, thank you so much for your time and for fitting me into your busy schedule. Uh, I know what it's like to have small children around and being pulled in many directions. (laughs) Oh, they're great though. It's totally worth it. Yes, it is. All right. Well, thank you. Cool. Thank you, Garrett.